Are you a dark dreamer? It is said that to best enjoy the light, you must first explore the heart and soul of the darkness. We are the artists who create in the shadows, whose dreams are designed to become your reality. I'm Stanley Weotter. Welcome to my world of the dark fantastic. Welcome to the world of dark dreamers. Are you a dark dreamer? Peter Straub, without a doubt, is. Born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1943, Peter Straub is one of the world's premier authors of dark and disturbing fiction. The creative force behind numerous international bestsellers Straub has unleashed a string of acclaimed and award-winning novels since the 1970s. Two of his earliest novels, Julia and the New York Times bestseller Ghost Story, have both been made into major motion pictures. Retitled The Haunting of Julia, the former starred Mia Farrow and Tom Conti. While Ghost Story boasted a stellar cast featuring Melvin Douglas and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Amongst his many bestsellers are Under Venus, If You Could See Me Now, Wild Animals, Coco, Houses Without Doors, Mystery, The Throat, Mr. X, and the short story collection Magic Terror. In 1984, Straub collaborated with his friend Stephen King to create the bestseller, The Talisman. He is currently working with King once more on a sequel to be published next year. Straub recently invited us to his home in New York City, where he spoke at length about what it means to willingly investigate the darkness. Peter, what does the term dark dreamer mean to you? Well, I guess uh, I take that to refer to people who are in my line of work. Um, that is, who, uh, whose, whose life is spent uh, inventing uh, other people's nightmares. That's one way to put it. Another way to put it is um, that these people investigate the sides and aspects and corners of life, otherwise repressed or ignored or denied by the rest of society. So I think that's quite a valuable uh, service. Um, and I, I definitely think it's worth doing, very much worth doing, because what is not spoken about must be spoken about uh, for there to be any kind of comprehensive understanding. As a young person, did you always have an interest in the dark side? I sort of felt mysteriously on home ground that I, I had magically walked through the right door and found myself where I was supposed to be, and I discovered I could do that. I could write something scary and have it be scary. Once I, once I just found the right keys, you know, I could, I could open that door and go in. Um, the right keys had to do with uh, evocations of feelings of uh, uh, loneliness, of exclusion, of uh, confusion, of uh, not understanding the, the real structures of the world or of other people's intentions toward you. Um, of uh, the imminence of death, of uh, the existence of malign and uh, evil forces that might, in this case, might be embodied in human beings and might not be. Um, it, was, it, it was wonderful to discover that I had some kind of ability to do something. And, uh, and it, was, it, it was really clear to me that, I, that I'd found the right thing. Horror writers were regarded as a pretty slimy bunch, and horror itself was seen as a subset of adolescent literature. It was, the, it, was the wor it was as bad as you could get. It was a lot worse than crime novels, and it was probably even worse than romance novels, because it, was, it seemed so degraded. That, whenever anything is like that, that means that's where to go, because nobody's paying any attention to it. You can do anything you want because it's all brand new, you know? You can make it up, you can reshape the whole thing to your design. Uh, I thought I was doing, then Stephen King came along. <laughs> and there's the wheel, you know, and there's the giant behind the wheel. 
uh, he reshaped the field in a, in a way very congenial to me, however. Um, but it, it, uh, the, the, the thought of a kind of uphill struggle is also appealing. Writing in itself is impossible. Writing well, actually writing a really good novel is an impossible act. Um, because in effect, you are making up a, a reality. You're inventing a reality, and it has to seem that way, especially if you're doing a horror novel, where uh, any, uh, any element of disbelief will blow the whole thing into, into toothpicks. If you're also writing in a, in a field that people happen to despise, it, it's very interesting to see what happens if you write something well, and if you change their expectations. Um, that was certainly always part of what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to move into this area, which was deeply congenial to me, and uh, show that it, that it was worth reading. Uh, I mean, if that sounds arrogant, <clears throat> and, I, and I'm sure I was pretty arrogant. Uh, for one thing, in, my, uh, in uh, the book of mine that was published for the ghost story, what I tried to do was really take on Edgar Allan Poe, Henry James, and Hawthorne, in effect, and I, I, I lost the battle. But it was a nice fight. It was uh, tremendous fun, I mean, to sort of evoke the ghosts of real masters and real geniuses. Um, so after that book, after Ghost Story, every time I published another book, the first sentence in the review was, horror master Peter Straub has published a new. So there I was. I published all these books in a row that had nothing supernatural at all in them, except as perceived by certain disturbed characters. They were all called horror novels. And then I thought, well, maybe they are horror novels. In that case, horror is really great because it has no boundaries. It, it, it'll, it'll, it'll go wherever you want it to go. It's, it's, it's permeable and malleable. Uh, the only thing that makes it horror, <clears throat> if, if it isn't the subject matter, which it isn't, obviously, is uh, the feelings it, 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 deals and the feel, it deals in and the feelings it evokes. So then, I, and now we're talking about the dark side <clears throat> of the emotional spectrum. But if you go deep enough, deeply enough, into emotions like uh, grief or anger, if you go down far enough, you find joy. And that, I mean, that is our great secret, I think. It's, certain, it's a secret known to any, anybody with any psychological perception. Um, so it's not, it's not an unknown fact. Though it is the last thing in the world that most contemporary Americans want to hear. So it's our duty to bring them the news. <laughs> is there a Peter Straub voice that goes through all your work? I would like to think that there is, and I think there almost has to be, because uh, I've written quite a bit by now, um, and the way I write isn't really l like anyone else, and I don't think it's supposed to be. If I write something that I, that I can perceive is really disturbing, I think I'm really doing my job. It doesn't happen all the time, because not everything calls for that sort of imagery or that sort of action. Uh, but when it is called for, the only way it works at all is if it touches people's buttons uh, so that some people will be thrilled and others outraged. Almost always this has to do with something in oneself, with, with something in the writer, his self or herself, uh, some aspect that they don't want really to investigate or to explore or to express. <clears throat> when you start getting the feeling that you're writing something you shouldn't, then you're always on the right track, I think. Anybody who thinks we live in a, well, we live in a normal world, but normal isn't the same as sane. It certainly is nothing like banal, um, benign. It is, it is often banal, but it's also often terrifying. Uh, the world is full of accidents waiting to happen. The universe doesn't care about us. Um, mm, people who assume that everything is going to go along just the way it is now and that everything is going to be okay live within a cocoon of uh, grandiosity uh, because, the, because they have been permitted to do so sooner or later. Someone they know and love is going to get cancer, and the, or, or an earthquake is going to level their house, and they're going to discover that we are all on thin ice. Um, that's you know the kind of writing people like me do, and that Steve does, and Dallas Mayer does. 
uh, is is really an attempt uh, to put up a thin ice sign, you know, and say, uh, pay more attention, wake up. There's half the world you're not looking at, and the half you're not looking at might be frightening, but it's also very beautiful. Many, many fairy tales, before, before they were bodlerized, were really bloody, and in their pure form, they still are. Uh, if you tell children a story like that, very often they'll come back and say, again, I want to hear it again. That means they want to get it inside them so they can master it. It tells them something they don't know that they need to know, but they do need to know it. Parents think that their child is showing a morbid streak, but what the child is doing is showing that, you know, is revealing an interest in that side of life which we all have within us. So there's nothing morbid at all about it. It's, it's, uh, it can be a fascination, but it isn't, uh, it isn't ill in any way. I often wonder to what extent, you know, decent horror writers knew trauma in childhood or had experienced trauma. Um, and I, I sort of wonder if it's a common thread. I, I know I certainly did. I, I, there were certain traumatic events in my childhood that are uh, indelibly, you know, in me and uh, had uh, effects both good and, and horrible. Mm -hmm. um, but it gave me my material in a way. It, you know, it means I, I, I didn't have to think twice about writing about fear because I really understood it. I better than understood it. I, you know, I lived there for a while. <laughs> and it wasn't much fun, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but it sure is educational. Um, it, in, it means you cannot ever deny the reality of such states. One of horror's essential tasks and duties, besides entertaining, is to bring to light uh, those aspects of cultural life or social life in any given context that have been repressed, de denied, or ignored. Um, the world is not a golf course, you know, and uh, we're not all Tiger Woods. <laughs> uh, we're not even, I don't know, name the worst golfer you ever heard of. Life is problematical, and it's supposed to be. Uh, we, feel, we feel terrible grief when a parent dies, and we feel that because we love that parent. Uh, it's, that kind of love goes down very deep, and therefore the grief goes down a long, long way. Um, but the grief is the other side of love, of that particular love. It always is. It's, it's uh, inescapable. Um, the, the worst thing to say to anyone is, oh, get over it, you know, because that is an invitation to turn your back on some very, very powerful force. The powerful force may be painful, and very likely it is, and that's why you want to turn your back on it. Uh, but it, it really, for the sake of psychic unity and for actual health, it should be faced. It can be faced piecemeal. It can be faced over time. But the longer it's repressed, the more it is going to express itself in hidden ways. You're going to start acting very foolish, and you won't know why, but it's because you you're, you've, you've, you put a lid on this bomb, which has exploded, and its uh, shockwaves are being felt in other aspects of your life. I don't think there's any literal connection between the reading matter and, uh, and taste in fiction or taste in films of mad people and the crimes they commit. They're mad people to begin with. Uh, they are embittered beyond reason. They are, they are out of touch with their inner selves, completely out of touch. They, they are incapable of dealing with their own anger in any way, in any other way, than to put, put it off on someone else in the form of a violent act. Uh, such people need help. Uh, but uh, uh, having them read Dick and Jane books isn't going to fix them at all. <laughs> there are times when I have felt that uh, I was done. So everything was going to go down the tubes. I mean, I couldn't afford my house anymore. My kids would have to go to public schools. Uh, we'd have to eat hamburger helper because I'd wagered it all um, on this book, and this book was a dead duck. Uh, whenever I start to feel that, and then I go lie down in depression, and I stare at the ceiling and turn on a record and read some book and try to get lost, sooner or later, some little idea happens to come. I think, oh, well, maybe I'm not down the tubes after all. But that is part of the deal. That's, that's part of the process of writing. And as far as I can see, almost every writer goes through that. At, some point during almost every book. It certainly happens to me in almost every book, or in, let us say, in every book. Uh, there's a moment when I think everything's gone, when, uh, when I, I lost it, whatever it was. 
By now, after all this time, I know I can remember that I felt that same way before and that I've never really lost it. In fact, I don't think I can lose it. I don't think it can be lost. Uh, so I just wait, you know, for f the idea to come to life again or for me to find the right way through it. Um, but, the, but those are just the conditions of the, of the particular process called writing, especially writing fiction. And once you submit to the, to the task, then you submit to the process. And then that means you have to submit to the worst aspects of it. Uh, and nobody has a right to complain about it, really, except in private. Nobody's going to pity me too much if I say, gee, I had a hard time writing that last book. <laughs> Peter, you mentioned earlier this obscure writer named Stephen King. <laughs> All right. I know that you once worked with him on an equally obscure novel named The Talisman. Could you tell us about that experience and also the fact that you're apparently writing a sequel to The Talisman? I met, uh, I met Steve King ages ago. He and his wife and their family were going to come to England to live for a year. Uh, he wrote to me <clears throat> saying, um, asking if it was possible for us to meet, so of course, it was, and after the Kings arrived, I met Steve in a Brown's Hotel. We had a long, long talk. Uh, I was very impressed by the guy. He was really winning. He was completely winning. He was lovable. He was also extremely complex and smart as hell. Uh, a little while after that, Steve and Tabby came to our house. Uh, and after about, about two in the morning, Steve said, Peter, you don't want to be fun. And I said, no, what, another beer? And he said, no, let's write a book together sometime. So I agreed. I thought that would be uh, just ducky. When he was writing, he played his record, which was a record by a, a Barbadian musician named Eddie Grant. It was called Electric Avenue. My record was uh, a record in which Michelle Legrand plays piano and Zoot Sims and Phil Woods and two very sturdy uh, bassists and drummer. Uh, fill a band out. So essentially it's a Zoot Sims, Phil Woods record, which means it was very high level, very beautiful, and uh, there's a lot of interplay. One time when I was writing, so it was my music that was playing, uh, Phil Woods and Zoot Sims did this thing where they sort of wound around each other, and Steve said, Peter, that's like you and me. Why, well, I, I just overflowed with joy. It was so, <laughs> it was so tender. This time around, we're, we're doing it pretty much the same way, uh, except we're not quite as crazy. We're both older. Uh, the, the atmosphere isn't quite as competitive as it was then, because both of us are trying to throw steel bolts, you know, st steel javelins at the other guy <laughs> and impress the hell out of him. Uh, this time, it's, uh, it was always very companionable. Uh, this time, it's even more so. We're now about, we're getting up to midpoint. I would say, in the new book. And uh, we still don't really have a title. Uh, the work is going very, very well. It's, uh, I, th I think it'll be a very nice book. It's a little more like a horror novel than a fantasy novel, uh, which is something both of us uh, uh, independently thought would be best for you know, this time around. We might even do, do a third sometime, because it occurs to me that what we are doing is like uh, an inferno a purgatorio, and then we'll need a paradiso. In our case, we started with the purgatory first. That's the boring one. And now we're doing the inferno. <laughs> it's a very nice process. Uh, I think at the end, if, uh, if uh, circumstances permit, I'll probably go to wherever Steve is at the time, maybe Florida, and uh, we will write the ending together again. Because that actually was one of the best experiences of my life. It was, it was sort of ravishing. Uh, we moved around inside each other's heads. Uh, you know, we, we, we would sometimes swap sentences during a scene. And when the other guy was writing, uh, the other one stood over his shoulder and read, read what was going on on the screen. Uh, it was really remarkable. Writers never get that uh, in the usual course of events. Uh, it, it's an absolute antithesis to the sort of loneliness that is generally re required to write fiction. It was the reverse of that. Uh, so it was, it was sort of blissful. It was really neat. And it'd be nice, it'd be nice to do it again. And I, if we do, I hope it turns out as well. As one 
goes toward the end of a long book, especially if it's a book that you have invested a good deal of your energy and your, uh, you, you know, yourself in, uh, a very peculiar thing begin, begins to happen because you know you're going to lose this book. It's going to go away from you. At the same time, it's like coming home uh, in a marathon, come, you know, seeing, seeing the tape and hearing the crowd. There's almost a soundtrack that uh, accompanies such moments. And uh, I was once so convinced of this that, that, that I started calling it ending music. And I'd say to people, well, now I can hear the ending music. The ending music is beautiful. It's orchestral. It's, 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 it's always in the background. But it's, uh, it's full of feeling, largely mournful feelings, but beautifully phrased. I think I wrote the ending of Mystery maybe 20 times. O other times, I, uh, I, I didn't want the ending music to stop, and I didn't want to lose the book. So I came to the end, and I just kept on going. Uh, many books have uh, little little sequels that kind of follow them for about 30 pages, <laughs> you know, like a tail behind a dog. Yeah. Uh, and then I realize what I'm doing, that I don't want to give it up, uh, and that I'm just, I'm, I, I don't want to lose those people either. So when I realize what I've done, I go back to the actual ending. I, I delete everything from that point on, and then try to, try to get the phrasing right uh, on the last page, because that really, you do have to hit the hammer. You, you have to hit the nail and ring the bell at that moment. And then, uh, then you send it to your editor, and you have to face the fact that other people have now taken your baby away from you, and you must, you must say goodbye to it. It's a terrible, terrible moment. It's like being evicted uh, because you built this house that is all around you, and where you are by now, perfectly comfortable. You know every room in that place. You furnished it yourself. You got it just the way you wanted it. There isn't, there isn't a square inch in that house that doesn't show the signs of your attention. And then you have to move out. And the only, the only remedy is to build another house. You know, it's a, it's a miserable way to make a living. It's so bizarre. You know, but, the, you know, it, it's like being a snail that has to build its own shell over and over and over. I really think nobody has a choice that we are given this material when we pop out of the womb. Uh, <clears throat> people always say, well, now that you made it, you can do something real. You can do something more serious. To which I say, first of all, you don't have a choice. And second, this is as serious as I can get. You know? <laughs> Join me here again on the wild side of the imagination, where a sense of wonder and a feeling of terror can often intersect. You'll find us waiting here, the Dark Dreamers. <laughs>